Last but not least, let us look at conditional literals. Actually, unlike the constructs we've been looking at before, like choice rules, cardinality and weight rules, that are actually primitive constraints of the solver, conditional literals are mainly addressed by the grounder. So often because you, the grounder can already evaluate the condition and then replace the conditional literals by a bunch of, of, of literals, or somehow it translates them into, into more complex rules, but we will not go into this detail now. Okay, let us look first of all, what is a conditional literal? Basically, you can understand such a conditional literal, at least in, in propositionally, this actually jumps to you as an, an, another implication. And one can see it as a nested implication, which cannot be nested any further, right? So L holds if L1 to Ln holds. Good, this is more or less the logical, uh, the logical interpretation of things. Where they really show off their value is when it comes to non-ground conditional literals, because then you can understand them rather like a set. And that's more or less, I think, my most preferred intuitive reading of them. And think of them as non-ground, because then such a conditional literal uh, can be regarded as simply the collection of elements L, such that the other conditions L1 to Ln hold. And this shows a little bit that in the end of the day, only the Ls will survive, while the L1 to Ln are only used to select the Ls. They are the conditions, right? But again, this is intuition because uh, the, the collection of elements, and I'm, expressive, I'm expressly vague here and just say collection of elements in the set, so the L's that we suggest here will be expanded differently depending on the context. And again, once you get used to this, this is pretty cool, but at the beginning I think you'll, you'll scratch your head a little bit. Okay, let me give you an example to ease your scratching. So assume we have uh, P of 1, P of 2 and P of 3, and we have Q of 2. So you can think of this as, as the set P, which contains 1, 2, 3, and the set Q, which contains 2. And now when we, when we form, when we form uh, this conditional literal, again, think of it as a set. We look at all the axes that belong to P and do not belong to Q. And all, for all the axes where this is true, and obviously this is the case for 1 and 3, we generate uh, an an instance of, predi of, of predicate R. So actually expanding this conditional literal here in the presence of these two facts yields R1 and R3. And again, I'm express, expressly a, a bit vague here because the context will now determine what happens with R1 and R3. And here's a rule that has it all. So I put the same conditional literal in the head of the rule, in the body of the rule, and also in a, in a cardinality constraint inside. And, well, as you, as you know, right, rules have in the body, a body represents a conjunction of elements. And as you do not know, but may know a bit later, and this is not so relevant for the course, in the head there is a disjunction of elements. Hence, if you expand the same conditional literal in the head and in the body, you get here a disjunction of elements which says R1 or R3 and here it says R1 and R3. Okay, Actually, uh, it's not really the symbol, the semicolon or the comma that tell us that this is a disjunction, this is a conjunction. It's simply the fact that it's the head and it's the body. And if you have several elements in the head, they form a, dis a disjunction and you have several elements in the body, they form a conjunction. Okay. And in the same way here, when they are expanded here, the, it, the set is, well, I think with sets it's pretty obvious, right? This set here is, is here, this is an intentional description of the set, and this is an extensional description of the set where all the elements are explicitly in, right? And here you have the set with R1 and R3. And again, the semicolon here doesn't, doesn't really matter. You, uh, it, there are reasons, for this, but that, let's not look into the syntactic details. Anyway, here things expand to a set, here to a conjunction and here to a disjunction. And the reason actually why we need here a semicolon, or why we write a semicolon instead of a colon, is imagine we in this cardinality constraint we would have several conditions. Let's say we would have another one that says, I don't know, A of X if B of X and not C of X. Then we had to separate them in the set 
And but we could not use a comma because the comma is already used and hence we separate these guys with a semicolon. And hence we use, on the, on, the, on the upper level, we use semicolons to separate different conditional literals and this is thus why we have here also a semicolon, right? But these are details that you will better learn in the practical exercise where it really comes to the, to the language. The most important here for you is to say, okay, if I have a conditional uh, literal, depending on its occurrence in the rule, whether it's in the head, in the body, or in a, in a constraint, it either expands, expands to a disjunction, a conjunction, or a set. Which, whether you now use separators, uh, comma, and semicolon, does not matter. It, it doesn't matter here on these levels. Here it matters a little bit, as I said before, because they are used for, for separating uh, conditional literals among each other. Okay, so these were conditional literals. This more or less closes our base language. And now, next we look at uh, language constructs for optimization. Stay tuned.